Um, it's it, it's so cool to be here. Um, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm flattered to have been asked to come and speak. Um, for the record, I I actually asked Nicole if I could talk, and three years later she emailed me back and said, "Yes, you can. You can you can come." <laughs> Not a word of a lie. Um, um, and I just want to say happy 10th birthday again. Uh, well done, Nicole and Flynn. It's a huge, um, yeah, it's a huge milestone. It's uh, doing anything for 10 years is a long time. So well done, everybody. Um, cool. So I just wanted to, this is the most important slide today um, because this is the contents. If you think I'm shit and you're bored, you can remember this. You know how much time you have left of me speaking and you could probably work out how long to go. Um, but I want to chat through the theme of this morning. Um, I want to give a quick background on me just so you guys know who I am. Um, and then three things I've learned that are, I guess, relatable to the theme, which is critical. Um, and then I would love to open for uh, some Q&A. Don't get my fat side and get that. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, so this morning's theme is critical. And um, yeah, this one threw me a little bit, to be honest, when Nicole sent the email through. Um, I did what all um, good researchers do and jumped onto Google and tried to figure out the, the meaning of the, of the word. And obviously, there's lots of different ways that um, that word can be interpreted. And um, they all kind of didn't really resonate with me except one thing. Uh, which was being in or approaching a state of crisis. And I kind of thought about this and thought, oh, hang on. I have to have a timer because I have OCD just so I know how much time I have left to talk. <laughs> so I'm going to put that there. Um, and it kind of made me think, like, my, my entire life has been a series of crises, like one after the other. And I guess um, what I've learned is how to... I guess adapt to these situations and try and um, find a positive solution and come through them and um, that's kind of what I, what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. Um, so I'm Pete, I'm a husband, um, I have three beautiful kids, um, I'm a designer, I'm a brand strategist, um, I used to surf, I don't really anymore because I have three kids and two jobs. Um, <laughs> I procrastinate. I was diagnosed with ADHD a couple of years ago um, and OCD or CDO in alphabetical order the way it should be. Um, um, I'm the founder of a non-alcoholic beer company called Heaps Normal. Um, I also run a branding studio called Electric and Analog. Um, I hate people eat with their mouths open and walk slowly during rush hour. Um, my dad was an abusive alcoholic. I lost him to suicide when I was 11. Um, I lost my mom when I was early 20s as well. Um, I once got hijacked and had a gun stuck in my mouth and they pulled the trigger and the trigger didn't go off. And, um, and we have a bulldog named Teddy that sleeps in our bed and I don't care if you judge me because she cuddles and it's great and I love it. <laughs> Um, I was born in a little town called Leamington Spa in England. It's a really posh little town full of posh little kids, um, like these two here, my brother and I. Um, we lived in a big house in England, and my dad used to import next world stainless steel, and um, you know, it was very wealthy, and we were kind of born in, with a silver spoon in our mouths, and um, used to go to Spain to a holiday house and dress up like pilots for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and then one day we moved to this place um, called Mshlanga Rocks in South Africa near Durban, which explains my weird accent. And um, life was good. And we lived in this huge house and we had a swimming pool and we were so lucky and went to a really cool school. And then one day uh, my mom picked us up from school and said, uh, your dad is dead. And they just got divorced a few months before and it was obviously a huge shock to the whole family. Um, and the weird thing was that this wealthy dad of mine was, was declared bankrupt when he died. So we went from living in this huge house to living on the 14th floor of an apartment block in a two bedroom apartment. Uh, my mom, my brother and I. And uh, it was a real kind of change of pace for us. You know, We didn't really know how to behave or what to do. And we got thrown in the deep end. And I went and worked at this restaurant from the age of 13 as a waiter at a place called Angelo's, which is like this really cool family run business. Um, we used to get caned at school when we were naughty, and I got caned five times by the headmaster, and he came for dinner about a week later, and I spat in his coffee at the end of the night. <laughs> True story. Um, I grew up surfing as well. I used to compete as a kid and got sponsored and all that stuff, and then um, wasn't good enough to make a career out of it. Um, and then I got a job in the creative industry. I, I, my first role out of design school was with a, uh, a company called International Trend Institute in Durban, and we used to work with 
companies like Plascon, Dulux, and um, a bunch of retailers like Mr. Price, and um, we used to work with amazing people like Lee Edelkurt, who's a, a, a Dutch trend forecaster who's really well known around the world. Um, and I really cut my teeth in, in the creative industry, and I just fell in love with it, like these amazing people doing really cool things, and um, that was still in the days of Quark Express and Freehand, I don't know if any of the older designers remember those programs, but that's what I grew up on. Um, and then I got a job at Quicksilver in marketing and was the art director there for about four years in, in, in Durban. And, and this was when the surf industry was in its prime. There was lots of money going around. Um, Kelly Slater was in his prime. We did stuff with Kelly and Jack Johnson and Tony Hawk and some really cool athletes. And they were throwing these million dollar events in New York. And um, we bought like a boat called the Quicksilver Crossing and it was like huge. Um, and I loved it and it was amazing. Um, and then one day I got home from work and I drove up this driveway. This was my mom's house. I was probably about 21 at the time. And um, that gate, there's an electric gate and I pressed a button and it opened and I drove up and I did what I always do and I kind of put my one foot on the floor and I had a gun stuck in my mouth. I had four guys walk up the driveway, um, stuck the gun in my mouth, um, were telling me to move and trying to steal the car. My mom came out and was screaming and thank goodness they didn't do anything to her. Um, and they pulled the trigger, but it didn't go off. And he was like kind of hitting it on the base of his hand, trying to make it go off. So it was, you know, talk about crisis. This was like a, a, a critical situation for me, but um, thankfully lived to tell the tale. Um, so I moved to London shortly afterwards. My, my grandparents were there. My, my little brother had moved out there a little bit earlier. Um, so I wanted to get a little bit less hijacked and thought London was a good option. <laughs> Um, and I met this beautiful girl who is um, way, way prettier than I should be getting and definitely punching above my league. Um, and I followed her to Sydney and we've been in the Sydney now for like 11 or 12 years, I think it is. Um, and then my brother and I started a company called Viewpop, which is a, um, a 3D photo app. And we, we raised some funding from investors and we went to Web Summit and we, won the, we came th sorry, third in the Uber pitch competition here in Sydney and um, it was all going really well. And then we got this email one day from uh, this guy, Glenn, from Huawei, which is one of the biggest companies in the world, um, saying, I'm a technology scout, and I'm interested to discuss the technology and also potential commercial engagement. When you get an email like this, certain things go through your mind. <laughs> things like that, and then also things like this. And we got really excited, and we thought we, uh, we made it. And uh, we, we chatted with this guy, we had a few phone calls with him, uh, he, he asked us if we had lawyers, we said no, he said lawyer up, because we're going to get into some heavy negotiations, and um, I think my wife had like chosen a house already on the <laughs> website or something, and, um, and we were booking flights to fly to London to have these talks, and then this happened, the CFO of Huawei got arrested at the border to Canada, and um, then... Mr. Trump got involved and said that there were spies and uh, he would never work with them ever again. And uh, our emails uh, went silent and no one answered our phone calls and that was the end of the, uh, of the Lamborghini dream. Um, but it's all good and these things all happen for a reason and I guess this is why I wanted to come back to um, you know, all these situations that have happened and where we are today. Um, so this is, a, um, a, a, I guess, a slide of our work um, of our branding studio, Electric and Analog. Um, we typically work with consumer technology brands um, and either reinvent kind of legacy brands or, or work with founders to create brands from scratch, which is really exciting. Um, and this is my now wife, who this is on our wedding day. We got married and um, we now have three kids. There's another child in the tummy over there, in case you hadn't realized. Um, my son's crazy, and our dog is very needy as well, as you can see. Um, and then, I guess, from, from running a branding studio, um, I got a little bit of imposter syndrome about three years in. We had a really difficult client who just made it a nightmare, and um, I thought, man, I can do this better than being told what to do by a client, so I'm going to create a brand of my own. And uh, created Heaps Normal, and we, we turned two years old at the end of July. And um, it's, yeah, it's really exciting and it's, it's really cool. And it's, um, it's something I, I wanted to do because, one, I'm not a very good drunk because I think maybe alcoholism runs in the family and my dad was an alcoholic. And um, if I have too many beers, I'll fight all of you here today <laughs> and you, you won't like me. So I, I'm, I haven't had a drink in two years, which I'm pretty stoked about, but I have lots of heaps of normals. Um, but I also wanted to create a brand and, and do it the way we wanted to do it without being told what to do by a client. And I think, um, yeah, this has just been so well received and it was definitely scratching an itch. Um, but it's epic and we get to do cool things like this. Uh, Dennis? 
let's go. My name's Dennis. I used to be a stay at home kind of guy, but these last few months, things have changed. I've been getting on the beers. And to be honest, I've been doing some pretty wild stuff. You see that street sign over there? Crazy story how I got that. Can I buy that? I've been tearing up the dance floor. I've even been known to chase the birds. You know what I mean? I never used to be able to make friends. Not anymore. Dennis. Yeah. Quite the adventure, really. What have you got there, Dennis? Oh. Non alcoholic beer. Thank you. That's, a, that's what we do for work. It's quite fun. Um, I often see like builders on building sites and I'm like, how do you guys do that, man? I'm tired from sitting in a chair all day like working in InDesign. It's crazy. Um, so, um, yeah, back to the theme of critical, like, you know, what does this mean? And, and um, you know, when, when I kind of look back, um, there's been these kind of moments of crises and I've moved countries three times and lived in three different continents for over a decade now. And um, there's, uh, there's, there's some lessons that I've learned through death and suicide of my dad and, you know, leaving family and, and moving across oceans and things like that. So I wanted to kind of share those um, today and I guess my learnings, and this is not me telling anyone what to do because this is just what's worked for me, um, but I kind of started thinking when I was putting this presentation together at like 11 o'clock last night, um, <laughs> thanks ADHD, um, you know, what, what does this mean to me and how, you know, how can I hopefully share some value that kind of um, hopefully you guys can take away with you today. So I wanted to share, uh, I guess, three quick lessons um, that, that I've learned that hopefully will, will bring value to you guys. So um, the, the main thing for me is like every situation, you have a choice. You have a positive kind of takeaway from it or you can have a negative. You can play the victim mentality or you can try and find a positive situation in it for, uh, for yourself. And that's, that's really kind of been a huge thing for me, you know, like no matter what the situation is, um, I, I genuinely think everything happens for a reason, no matter how critical it is. Um, I'm like the happiest I've ever been. I run two cool companies, it doesn't feel like work, I've got three beautiful kids, my wife's a superstar, um, and you know, I don't think any of this stuff would have happened if I didn't get hijacked and all those things and my dad passing away, it's kind of like this chain of events that are all linked to each other. So um, I, I really do think everything happens for a reason and try and find the positive out of it. Um, but the first lesson I wanted to share was perspective. Um, and that's always try and look at things from a different angle. <laughs> I don't get this one, because all I see is a massive cock. I don't know what anybody else sees. Um, but just really important to try and look at things from a different position. So this is my grandfather. He'd be so bummed if, I put his, if he knew I was putting his face after a massive cock. I'll tell you that <laughs> And, and sorry, Pops, um, I'm sure he'll understand, but um, he was my hero. He, he passed away about 12 years ago, which was, I guess, the catalyst for us to leave England and move to Australia. Um, and he was an absolute legend. He was my mom's dad. Um, he had a company in Coventry in, in the UK called Midland Diamond Tooling. Um, it was a precision engineering firm. The only thing back then that could cut a diamond was a diamond. So his company used to make these tools with diamond tips on them that were then cut diamonds. So the tools are worth a lot of money and pretty expensive, as you can imagine. Um, and he had about 40 workers that worked in the kind of the back of this factory uh, in Coventry. And uh, one day he had one of his kind of managers come up, and his name was Ray, and he said, Ray, I've got to talk to you about something. He goes, um, there's, there's tools that have been stolen out of the storeroom. And uh, you know, obviously the tools are worth a lot of money. So Pops was like, well, okay, this is a big deal. Uh, let's find out who it is. They found out who it was. It was a guy named John. The problem was John just happened to be the most specialist machinist money could buy. This was before LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff, so, as you can imagine. Um, so my granddad was in a situation where he went, okay, well, this guy's stealing from me, but he's also going to be really, really hard to replace. So um, he called John in and had a meeting with him and uh, said to John, I'm going to give you a promotion. And John said, why? And he said, because you've been working really hard, you work with us for a long time. Um, part of your new job is going to be looking after stock take of the storeroom. Uh, 
and surprise, surprise, um, nothing ever got stolen again. Pops managed to hold on to his most gifted machinist and um, you know, not have to go through the process of recruiting someone and finding somebody again from scratch. So for me, this is just such an awesome example of looking at a shitty situation, trying to look at it from a different perspective um, and, and, and trying to find a solution. So I just love how that's come together. How we track it for time. Cool. Um, the second lesson I've learned is to reinvent yourself. Um, I have a really good friend named Carl Addy, who's a, a creative director at the Mill in London, and he told me this really cool story. Um, this is about ice harvesters back in the 1800s. So um, back then, how people would have ice in their homes is they would have these horse-drawn carriages with these huge sleds on the back that had these massive blades that would cut these kind of squares in the, in the ice. Uh, the problem with that being they could only operate in cold climates, they could only operate in winter, um, all the elements had to be right, um, and obviously lots of limitations around that. Now I think that was up until about 1840, and then in 1840, um, some clever person decided if we, well, figured out how, how to heat, sorry, how to cool down water and make ice. So ice harvesters stopped operating, and ice factories came about, and people would go and buy these big blocks of ice, and they would cool down their, fo their food and their, and their, their drinks, and, and that's how ice was made. And then in the early 1900s, someone figured out how to make this ice factory into a little fridge, as we know it today. And the really interesting thing is, at every single innovation curve, entire industries became obsolete and went out of business. So when the ice factories were born, all those ice harvesters that classified themselves as, as, as ice harvesters had, had no job anymore, they literally had nothing to do. And it happened again when the refrigeration factories came around. So um, just a really, really cool reminder just to reinvent yourself and I guess also define yourself by um, you know, the value you bring, not by actually what you do. Um, and the third lesson is just thinking different. Um, Apple stole this from me annoyingly, but um, it's, it's no big deal. Um, this, this is a line in, uh, in, in America in the 1930s in the Great Depression. Um, some of the toughest times ever known to humankind. Uh, all these guys are literally waiting to, uh, for, for kind of dull money. Uh, there was no money going around, there's no jobs. Times are really, really hard. And um, one of the most common um, ingredients in a household was flour, because moms would buy flour and they'd cook bread and cakes and, uh, and feed the family. And uh, what happened was, out of pure desperation, people would, um, these, these, the flour came in these huge cotton sacks and they would cut them up and they would make shirts and dresses and tablecloths and all that sort of stuff because they just had no money to buy those things. And uh, what happened was one of, the, um, one of the flower companies at the time realized what was happening and they started actually working to make the solution better for their customers. So they printed pretty patterns on the flower sacks with flowers and animals and they started printing um, like, you know, like all these beautiful patterns. They started printing uh, instructions and cut guides and where to cut the flower sacks when you finish with the flower and how to turn it into a shirt or a dress. Um, and they even had different inks. So the ink, this was the washout ink, which was the instructions. It would tell you how to wash that fabric. So it would wash out the instructions ink, but not wash out the, the pattern ink, um, which is incredible. And it's estimated that by the end of the Great Depression, there were flower companies in the US that had, that had clothed over three and a half million people. And um, I just think this is such a cool example. A lot of these flower companies are in business today, over 100 years later. Um, and just a really cool example of thinking differently um, and really putting your customer first. And I think at times of crises, um, you know, thinking differently is, is, such a, is such a cool way to go. Um, that's the end of my talk, guys. I wanted to, um, I wanted to throw it out to the, to the, to the floor and uh, do any Q&A stuff. We can have a chat. Um, you can follow me on social. I, I like to connect there. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, but I hope that brought you some value. And I'd, uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'd love to uh, get some Q&A going. Thank you. Safe place, guys. Nothing's off. Nothing's off. Oh, oh, God. Here we go. Maybe right here. Uh, thanks so much. Really loved it. I'd, I'd like to hear um, a little bit about how you started Heat's Normal. Like, did you go into it completely cold, knowing nothing about brewing? Or like, what was the difference between brewing an alcoholic beer versus a non-alcoholic beer? And um, did you have to skill up? 
yes to all of those. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to start a beer company. Um, uh, basically, what happened was I, um, yeah, like, you know, wear my heart on my sleeve, so happy to talk about this stuff. But um, I guess with my dad being an alcoholic, um, I've never had a good relationship with alcohol. I was that guy who would go out and be so much fun and then wake up in the morning and couldn't remember how I got home. And nine times out of 10, it was fine. But the one time I noticed some funny faces in the audience and it does the same thing. Um, you know, what, every now and again, I, I get a phone call from someone going, man, you were fighting with a bouncer last night, it's three times the size. He was like, great, that's a, that's a good night out. Um, and just behaving like a complete tool. So um, it was really scratching an itch for myself. I had no idea how to start a beer company. I went and saw uh, three breweries around Sydney. Uh, pitched the idea, got politely laughed out of the room. Um, there was a guy named Andy Miller, who's our CEO and a co-founder of mine at the moment, who um, had been working at Young Henry's as the head of marketing. He'd left and was consulting, and I, he was kind of the fourth person I spoke to in the last resort. I was about to throw the towel in, um, and he got it. He was just like, I get it. It's like everyone else I'd spoken to was like, non-alcoholic beer is never going to work. Who would drink non-alcoholic beer? It's ridiculous. And, um, but I just, I was like a dog with a, with, a, with a stick, I just couldn't let it go. So um, yeah, spoke to Andy, Andy pulled in Benny, who's a, a head of product and a, another co-founder, uh, who's our head brewer. Um, and then I grew up with a guy named Geordie Smith, who's a pro surfer, we've been friends since we were like super young, like t uh, 10, 12 years old. Um, and we kind of went to town and, and Benny uh, home brewed in his kitchen. Um, and we did about, the first four tasted terrible. I thought this is gonna be the worst business ever. It's never gonna work. But the fifth one tasted a little bit better and then it got better and better and eventually got it to a point where we were super excited about it. Um, and we scaled up. So we work with a company called Brick Lane in Victoria. They're our brew partner, they're our contract brewer. Um, and in terms of how we do it, it's an interesting question because normally non art beer, it's been around since the 70s. It was in Germany, it was called auto beer back in, in Germany in the 70s. But there's two ways to normally do it. One's reverse osmosis and one is a vacuum distillation. And they both involve bringing the, like essentially taking the alcohol out right at the end of the process. The problem with that is it takes half the flavor out as well, which is why traditionally they've been quite watery and given non out beer a bad rep. Um, so what we did, uh, we kind of researched the process. Benny is the ex-head brewer for Grifter, Young Henry's, Four Pines. He uh, has an incredible track record of being a brewer. Um, and we found this yeast that micro ferments at just under 0.5%. So um, that was kind of the game changer for us. Um, anything under 0.5% is legally non can be declared as non-alcoholic. So um, a ripe banana can have up to 0.5%, a glass of orange juice, um, bread that's been on the shelf for more than a week because those sugars naturally ferment. Uh, kombucha can be up to 0.5% as well. Um, and we don't take anything out at the end, so it still has that full beer flavor and um, doesn't make you act like an idiot. It's, it's the best one out there. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. That's really cool. He said it's the best in the world, everyone. It's about <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, great question. Great. We can go deep on this if you want. So we do, we do a thing. Just repeat the question. Oh, of course. Yeah, sorry. Um, the question was, um, how, do you, how did you get diagnosed with CDO? Yeah. Which is OCD, just the right way. Um, so we, we do a, a practice at Heaps Normal, uh, which is we call a daily check-in. We do it on Slack every day. Um, there's kind of three elements to it. There's FYIs, intentions, and asks. So at the end of every day, you don't have to do it, you, you should do it. Uh, you kind of go, FYI, like this happened today, I designed this, I had this conversation, I had this meeting, intentions, by the end of the week, I'm gonna do this, this and that. Um, and then ask, because obviously we need help with anything. And Andy, my, my co-founder called it out, he was like, man, there's stuff on your intentions list that's been there for months and it's gonna take you like 12 minutes to do those things. Like, well, what's going on? And I was like, oh. Got a point. Um, and then I kind of looked at it, I was like, man, that's, I don't want to do that shit, you know, it's just boring for me, so I didn't really want to do it. Um, so I started speaking to some people, went and saw a GP, got a referral to a psychologist, um, had to sit down for like three hours and go through like all childhood stuff and um, got diagnosed with ADHD, um, OCD, and a thing called GAD, which is General Anxiety Disorder. It's not that bad, it's just like a weird doctor term, like I'm fine. Um, <laughs> I think, I hope. Am I, am I okay? Am I, yeah, I'm joking. Um, so, um, so yeah, got a diagnosis, got put on to uh, Ritalin and then Dexamphetamines, hated both of them. They kind of maybe chew my jaw off and, and 
couldn't sleep. And so I'm off it now, and um, I am currently trialing medical cannabis, which is quite interesting. Not stoned right now, just for the crowd. <laughs> um, but uh, it's like an evening thing. You use like a vape, and then it just helps you sleep. And then there's a morning one that's supposed to help you concentrate, but just makes me blazed and can't do any work and want to eat cookies on the couch. So I'm not doing the day one. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Go are you surprised by the people that have uh, taken up Heaps Normal? Like, is it just, is, or has it been kind of like who you expected to drink it? No, that's a great question. So surprised. Um, pregnant women. I had no idea, man. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, we get messages like weekly of people going like I'm pregnant and I can still go to the pub and have a beer with my friends I never even knew that was a thing um, it's been an interesting two years like the first few months we would go into pubs and be laughed out of the room and just be like get out of here and we had one guy in Melbourne we <laughs> went to go and see him and we cracked him a can and he drank he's like oh man this is delicious this is a good craft beer and we're like cool and we, and we said, uh, what, what alcohol percent do you think? He goes, oh, it's like a 4% or 5%. And as he was taking a second sip, Benny said it's non-alcoholic. And he spat it on the floor and told us to get out. We're like, fuck, yeah, just wild. People are crazy. So, um, so uh, and we, kinda, we came back a few weeks later and because he, he asked us to come back. And so I might have reacted a little bit. <laughs> no shit. Um, and uh, we kind of said to him, well, you know, do people come here that don't drink? And he said, yes, they drink water and I make no money. And we went, what if they bought a heap small and they made some money? He was like, oh, yeah, and the light bulb goes off and then they buy it and then they become a customer. So, yeah, great question. Um, who else? Yeah, just like we, we, we've, we've gone the opposite route of like demographics. We say we work with athletes and artists um, and you can define it however you want, like very much in the tone of Nike, you know, everyone with... An able body is an athlete, or a body is an athlete, um, and it's just—it's just we've been so surprised with the uptake, you know. Like, um, what about the guy that, like, was it in Canberra? What happened in Canberra? That could drink with his mates. Remember that story? Oh, the old man. Yeah, this is a cool one. Thanks, Nick. You know, you know the story better than I do. Um, we we went into we went into uh, we did a little road trip to Canberra. I went to see one of the bottle shops there, and kind of just said, oh, how's it all going? And this is pretty early on. And he said, um, man, this old guy came in yesterday, it was like late 80s, early 90s, and he looked really downcast. And he said, he said to the man, he said, are you okay? He goes, no, I've just come back from the doctor. He said, I can't drink anymore, so I'm gonna die. Don't wanna die yet. Don't wanna stop drinking beer either. So he sold him a four pack of heaps normal and said, just give this a go. And guy took it away and uh, came back the next day and bought a case and turns out there's a group of them, like five or six of these old dudes in their 80s, 90s. Their wives have passed on. Their church is going to the pub at four o'clock every day, having like three beers, talking shit, and going home to feed their dogs and go to bed. And all of a sudden that was taken away from him. And he literally was at the end of his tether. He didn't know what to do. So uh, he tried heaps normal, and he came back the next day, bought a case. All his mates came and bought a case. <laughs> the pub is now a customer of ours. There's like this running joke of these old 60s that drink heaps normal in the corner. So that was a cool thing. Um, I live in Manly. There's a bottle shop we're, we're in called Winona there, which is a really cool little bottle shop. And... Um, yeah, we, we, we went in there in the early days as well and we're speaking to the guys there and they said, oh, these like four young dudes came in yesterday, like late teens, early 20s, and they were scanning the fridge for beers and um, she said they all took a four pack of Heaps Normal and she went, they've fallen for the packaging or the branding, they don't realise it's non-alcoholic, so felt it was her duty to call it out and said, hey guys, just let you know, there's no alcohol. And they all went, yeah, we know. Uh, we're landscape gardeners, it's Friday night, we've got a house party, we work in the morning, we want to go for a surf before work. And this is the first time like she'd ever seen anything like that. So it's, it's crazy how, um, you know, I think the category in general, it's not just heaps normal, but people are being a lot more open to it. And I think it's down to a few things. Um, like our timing was impeccable, COVID really worked in our favour. First lockdown, everyone went to Dan Murphy's and got hammered. Second lockdown went, fuck, we can't do that again. Um, <laughs> And we were just there, and people bought it and tried it and enjoyed it, and um, you know we got some really cool messages. Um, I think the health and wellness category is exploding in general around the world. People are really conscious about what they put into their body. Um, I wish I got that memo when I was younger. I joke that my body's my temple. My wife said the other day, your body's a warehouse, and I was like, oh, <laughs> God. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been kind of overwhelmingly cool to see the different like age groups and demos of people that are kind of. Um, yeah, drinking this cool thing that we've made. Yeah, I'm just interested, you kind of touched on COVID. Um, it was, yeah, I feel like Australia had this really like uh, big moment with itself during the second lockdown where 
as you said, everyone really drank their way through the first one. The second one, there was this huge conversation around how much alcohol they drink and all that sort of stuff. I'm wondering, um, as far as overseas, how have you gone overseas? Because Australia um, had famously has a culture of binge drinking. Yep. Um, and so that conversation was eventually going to come about how much we drink and COVID really brought it out. When, what's your experience with taking heaps more overseas? Um, Europe obviously have a very big drinking culture. They drink a lot more in the streets. It's a lot more acceptable. Um, yeah, as someone who's been loving heaps more since 2020, uh, might be able to challenge you for how many I've drank as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I'm just wondering how it's been overseas. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Nicole, you don't want me to repeat that question, do you? Please say that. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, I'm joking. The question was, um, what, what, I guess, what are our plans for overseas or what's yeah. our opinion of overseas? Yeah, yeah, cool. So we're currently in about 4,000 venues around Australia. We're on shelf in New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Malaysia about to be as well. Um, for me, like just before we launched it or before we, we had early planning stages, I'd been... I've been to LA a couple of times and I'd done some work in Tokyo with SoftBank and was kind of overwhelmed with um, like the youth over there, like just don't drink, you know, like I've got friends in, in, in LA that run these really cool stores and like, you know, young people, I sound like an old man, um, you know, young, young people come in and they'd, they'd be microdosing on weed or LSD or whatever, and, and, but not drinking alcohol, interestingly. Um, so that was, for me, was a thing to go, hang on, this could, this could be a thing. And everyone's drinking kombucha and CBD-infused teas and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the, the response has been, like, just so overwhelming. We get hit up pretty often by distributors around the world, um, about, particularly about the U.S. and Europe. Um, non up beer, like I said, in Germany has been a thing for a, forever. A lot of Europe as well, Spain for that matter, too. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of exploring those options at the moment. Uh, we're in conversations with a few distributors to go international a bit more. Um, I think the, the trick in doing that is doing it the right way and not just, you know, Athletic Brewing are, are a, a big non-up beer in the US and they've come into Australia, they've just gone straight into shelf into, into Woolies and, and Coles and supermarkets with no media spend, no brand awareness. Um, I think it's really hard to do that and, and our take is let's do that properly, let's set up an office, you know, in LA or New York, wherever that might be, or. Um, or, or you know those different territories and build the brand properly from the ground up with, with staff on the ground. So hopefully in the next year or two you'll see um, a lot more heaps normal when you go and see it. I hope that answers your long question. Um, I think we've had, we've, okay, we have time for one more question. Oh. Oh. Who's got a good one? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, in the back. You guys? Better be good. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, my question would be, like, I see you as a creative, but also as a serial entrepreneur, because you've done a few things, um, and this is the, the huge store one is a very successful one, but I'm interested in, are you stepping away from design, and you're going to be focusing on the beer? Like, how do you, how do you find yourself, like, evolving, pivoting from just that's such a good question. Um, you know, I told you I have OCD and ADHD earlier. That plays into that question so much. Like, you wouldn't believe. Because, like, you know, I guess being the brand custodian, like, it's so, like, as any designer, I think you're so precious about the brand. So we've got a designer who's just started named Maddie, and she's awesome. And, and I'm like, oh, don't do that with that font. But then she does it, and it kind of works. And just re relinquishing a little bit of that kind of, um, you know, analness. Is that even a word? Like... <laughs> Um, but but yeah, it's um it's it's been an interesting journey. Like even running a branding studio, like I've we, we, that that studio has flexed up and down quite a lot. We were up to like eight people at one point. We had an office at WeWork in Piermont and huge overheads, and and it's gone back down to my wife and I. She's the project manager. I'm I'm on the tools still. So I th I feel like as a designer, like I need to design still. But as I guess as a business person, entrepreneur, I hate that I hate people call themselves entrepreneurs. It sounds so wank. But as an entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> It's, it's kind of important to, I, th I think, to kind of get out of the tools a little bit and understand more of the business and the, the science of, of running a company as opposed to the arts. So it's a, I find it a challenge to kind of step away from the design side of things, but you know, there's designers out there who are better designers than me that hopefully will um, do a better job than I can. Does that answer your question? Guys, that's all we've got time for. We could probably sit here all day and chat to Pete. Um, can, can we please give him a huge round of applause?